Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll call the session to order. Um, give a few opening remarks. Uh, obviously, this is our, our last meeting for this um, iteration of the PAC DBIA. And uh, we're going to focus in on our trip uh, that we took in the end of June, July, and then on the re recommendations from that trip. Um, just from a standpoint of, um, from our perspective in the private sector, Mr. Secretary, thanks for your support and your team's support and the government's support around the trip. We had uh, four, four, four countries we visited that uh, things w went very well, with the exception of showers in Kenya and uh, airplane rides from Ethiopia. But other than that, it was a, it was a very good trip. I think um, one of the key things is the focus that we had talked about in, uh, when we wrapped up in, uh, in Accra was uh, the government, U.S. government support of, um, of private sector across Africa as we try to work together in bringing more business to a number of American companies. And I thought I'd just give a couple of anecdotes from the last week and a half. Um, which I think still underscores the importance of doing that. I met with uh, President Kenyatta in Kenya last week when, uh, st when I was in Nairobi. And, uh, you know, again, he's got a number of initiatives tied in with the Chinese. He very much supports and is supportive of U.S. Um, <clears throat> um, business and activities in, in Kenya. But again, the financing issue becomes an issue for all the countries, especially as now they're looking at uh, debt ceilings, et cetera. The second one is uh, yesterday, you know, Tuesday, I was in, oh yeah, that was yesterday. I uh, was in New York and um, at the UN meetings and we had a, uh, the chamber uh, of you know, US Africa Business Center, which I also co-chair, um, had a session with uh, the president of Ghana and he sat there with a bunch of American businesses around, and this was after our trip, and talked to us about how China was approaching them, and he hasn't seen anything from the United States. And I, was, I wanted to kind of challenge him, the MCC compact and a few things, but I didn't think it was quite the appropriate uh, thing. But there, that just shows the focus that we need to do to continue to push, and more importantly, continue to publicize and be, be proactive from it from that standpoint to make sure that people know where support is coming from. And then the third one, and you, you were speaking in Ghana and you, you talked quite a bit about the Chinese and, and all, which was uh, very supportive, but it's not just the Chinese. And we are right now, we being GE, are right now in a battle in Iraq, you, some of you may have seen it in the newspapers, for a 10, 10 to $15 billion power order and we're battling against the government of Germany, who's coming in very supportive of our competitor. And uh, so it's not, just, um, it's not just the Chinese, it's also the Europeans. And I think, again, a lot of the recommendations around financing and what we can do will really continue to focus in on what the U.S. government can do tied in with the private sector. So uh, I think this is very apropos and very, very good timing from that standpoint. And uh, I look forward to uh, work having all of the uh, recommendations be presented. So thank you. Laura, you want to? Um, before we begin, just one other housekeeping order. Uh, it's important that when you're speaking, uh, the red light will come on. It's important that you turn it off after you're speaking so that um, it doesn't uh, uh, affect uh, the next person being able to speak the way the, uh, the microphone system is set up. So uh, if I have to interject, I'll remind you, uh, but we want to be able to capture all of this um, on a, a recording, and it's important that we follow the guidelines that we've been given on that. Um, I, and I want to uh, begin by saying thank you, uh, Jay, and Mr. Secretary and Under Secretary Kaplan. Um, I'm really pleased to be back here uh, and uh, with the rest of the council. Uh, we had uh, what Jay introduced uh, was a phenomenal trip um, that was really enlightening and really helped us see a lot of the challenges and opportunities that exist on the continent. And Mr. Secretary, we're very pleased to be providing you with the uh, report from that fact 
fact-finding trip as well as the important recommendations coming out of it because we think it's going to provide some really concrete additional steps that can be taken beyond the ones that we specifically took during the trip. And so this wasn't just a trip to go and see. This was a trip where we went and made things happen and we're building on them going forward. And so um, we're going to uh, begin uh, with going through uh, specific aspects of the trip. And I really look forward to having the input from the council members on many of the observations we saw on the ground, as well as providing you, Mr. Secretary, with the good recommendations for going forward. And finally, thank you for your leadership in bringing this to the attention of the President, keeping the momentum going and making this something that uh, pr is going to produce some concrete result results for U.S. Uh, uh, investment and export opportunities across the continent. Thank you, Laura. I was honored on behalf of Secretary Ross to lead council members on the first three stops of the historic trip to Ethiopia, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, and Ghana. Before I introduce the secretary, who will highlight the significant outcomes of the trip, I'd just like to note that I believe it was an exciting experience for us all and a real adventure. I valued the time that I spent with all the PAC DBIA members. Your commitment to the Council and to the work of advancing the U.S. commercial relationship with Africa was evident throughout our journey. We thank you for it. It is now my privilege to introduce the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross. In this role, he serves as the principal voice of business in the Trump administration, ensuring that U.S. entrepreneurs and businesses have the tools they need to create jobs and economic opportunity. The former chairman of W.L. Ross & Company, Secretary Ross has over 55 years of investment banking and private equity experience. The secretary, on behalf of President Trump, administers the council and has a very keen interest in leveraging the work of the PAC DBIA to help deepen trade and investment relationships between the United States and African countries. We at the Department of Commerce are very fortunate to have a leader at the helm with the character, experience, and intellect of Secretary Ross. Secretary Ross. Well, thank you, Gil, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Jay and Laura, for leading the PAC DBIA for the past two years. And to all the members of the Council, <clears throat> for the time you've devoted to improving the business prospects in Africa for many other American companies and their workers. Thanks also to the individuals from the federal enterprise who are engaged in these efforts. After all the work you've done over the past two years, PAC DBIA has proven to be a successful model of collaboration between the public and private sectors. You've created tangible and lasting results, and we pledge to continue the progress you have made. Success has come through your dedication to civic service, an essential component of our democracy. Success has also come through your commitment to being on the ground in Africa and developing the recommendations we will be discussing today. I look forward to those deliberations. Last year, as you remember, I asked the Council to identify the most pressing challenges American companies face when approaching, competing, and operating in African markets. In response, you produced a clear and insightful report that led to the trip to Ethiopia, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. I know there's a lot more to do, but you should take pride in the fact that your devotion to this cause has already yielded beneficial results for many people who are not even aware of the work you've done. For example, across the four countries visited on the two-week trip, $1 billion of commercial deals and government engagements were signed. To put that in perspective, total U.S. exports to the four countries 
in all of 2017 were only $2.5 billion. So the trip continues to pay dividends. Last month, during the state visit to Washington of Kenya President Uru Kenyatta, another 850 million of deals were signed with Kenya alone. That included a $500 million project to develop an integrated nationwide information and telecommunications network for the government of Kenya. Another major achievement of the trip was the signing of the Memoranda of Understanding with the governments of Ethiopia, Kenya, and Ghana. I think the only reason there wasn't one with Cote d'Ivoire is the government fell the night we, the group was leaving there. So it was a little bit of a difficult circumstance. But we are developing a similar MOU with Cote d'Ivoire. These agreements identify priority projects upon which American companies can build. They also provide the U.S. government with the guidance needed to support those projects. Furthermore, the MOUs address barriers <coughs> that hinder U.S. investment in trade in each of the countries visited. Eliminating these barriers will not only help all U.S. companies interested in expanding in Africa, but the indigenous firms located in those countries, allowing them to grow with an improved business climate. When those companies add employees and wealth to their societies, our companies can grow with them. These MOUs have set a new precedent for our bilateral commercial engagements in Africa. They reflect what was heard repeatedly in all of the countries that were visited, that there was a steadfast preference to do business with American companies. African business executives, government officials, and ordinary citizens prefer to work with Americans due to our transparency, our customer service, the durability and reliability of our products, the dedication to local skill development and employment, and a common cultural heritage. They also expressed a desire to address the challenges that American companies face in Africa, such as corruption, poor infrastructure, and the inequitable business practice of competitors. They're prepared to work with us to resolve those obstacles, and we are ready to work with them. Finally, thank you, Under Secretary Kaplan, for your outstanding leadership and the manner in which you led the PAC DBIA delegation throughout Africa. Thank you also for your dedication to following through on the initiatives that were stated on the ground in Africa and by the PAC DBIA. By the time I joined you in Ghana, I was astonished by the amount of buzz that had been generated by the trip and by how much had already been accomplished. With that, I look forward to the discussions about the report and its recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, <clears throat> we are going to go through now the presentation of the trip su summaries and then into the recommendations. So we've got quite a few, and um, so let, we'll keep, keep it uh, moving along. Our first one will be about Ethiopia, and uh, Fred Sisson. Uh, there you are, Fred. Thank you, Jay. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, the Council was uh, warmly greeted by the Ethiopian government when we arrived. Uh, we see significant opportunities as we went through the, uh, the trip. We saw significant opportunities for U.S. businesses in Ethiopia, especially given its growth rate and the young population that exists there. Um, Although, as we, uh, uh, even though the government <coughs> is encouraging private sector investment, one of the things that we did pick up is that there is some skepticism within some in the government around private sector investment and controls from the uh, controls that the government will have over private sector investment. We believe that good partnerships will overcome these. The, uh, the two MOUs that were signed in Ethiopia were a great base for starting to establish a, a long-term partnership with the government of Ethiopia, as well as establishing new business uh, in Ethiopia. 
the MOUs were signed around the strategic, obje uh, strategic projects in Ethiopia as well as the Power Africa 2.0 objectives. Um, coming from the energy sector, we're, we're encouraged by both of these and we look forward to participating in Ethiopia. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Tom Hardy. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thinking back on the trip, I think it was so fortuitous that the Business Council identified Ethiopia at a time that's it's going through kind of a political and economic renaissance. Um, and to be on the ground at, on, at the beginning stage uh, was important, I think, for not only the U.S. government, but U.S. companies to see. I think as USTD, we are encouraged by what Ethiopia is doing, the efforts they're taking to encourage private sector investment, the privatized state-owned enterprises. Um, and we have, are jumping at that opportunity even since uh, returning from the visit. We just recently concluded a project in a geothermal uh, power project for 50 megawatts um, with a private Ethiopian company and are continuing to work with Ethiopians uh, in the aviation sector as well as further expansion of energy. And I think the visit that we spent, um, the time we spent in Ethiopia really has spurred us to recognize the opportunities that exist, not only for the companies uh, on, this, on this council, but for U.S. businesses across the country. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Tom. Eric? Thank you, Jay. Um, as others here, we welcome Prime Minister Abiy's commitment to making Ethiopia's economy more dynamic and welcoming for private sector investors. Um, we see this as an important window of opportunity for engaging in Ethiopia. Moving forward, um, a strong macroeconomic um, reform and business climate framework will be important to sustaining growth, addressing the current debt burden, and increasing space for private sector growth and investment in Ethiopia. Of course, financial sector modernization and reform are similarly important, um, and we saw this on the trip with the discussions around um, the shortages in foreign exchange availability. Um, and this is going to be critical to attracting investors and supporting productive and job-creating firms in, in Ethiopia. Um, so going forward, um, Treasury is deepening its policy dialogue with Ethiopia. And we are engaging the government regarding potential for technical assistance to support the government's reform goals um, in a number of these areas. And we'll look forward to continuing that dialogue. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, Bennett Harmon? Yep, there. Good morning. We were pleased to hear that the Ethiopian government during the trip signaled a renewed. Okay. Uh, we were pleased to hear that during the trip, the Ethiopian government signaled an interest in renewing their WTO accession process. Uh, the WTO accession process is fundamentally a domestic reform um, process because it, uh, it, under it requires undertaking significant changes in market opening. But those trade liberalizing reforms would, in fact, advance uh, significant long term benefits to Ethiopia's economy. So we, we think. It's very important that they pursue that, that path. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll now move on to Kenya, my home for the last seven and a half years. We'll hear what you guys are going to do. <laughs> so, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning. Thank you, Jay. Good morning. Thank you, Secretary Ross, Under Secretary Kaplan, Laura. The fact-finding trip to Kenya included a series of meetings with the President of Kenya, numerous cabinet secretaries, and Kenya business leaders. President Kenyatta demonstrated a strong commitment to attracting U.S. business investment in Kenya. He held several meetings, supported the signing of the MOU, and also announced progress towards launching the Kenya Airways nonstop flight to New York. Highlights of this trip included the MOU, which focused on increasing U.S. private sector participation in proprietary infrastructure development and other projects intended to achieve the goals of President Kenyatta's Big Four agenda. 
Kenya has annual economic growth of 5 to 6 percent, and President Kenyatta's Big Four agenda provide the potential for increased U.S. business investment in Kenya, particularly in infrastructure, housing, health care, and agriculture. During the meeting between Undersecretary Kaplan and Kenya's Cabinet Secretary for Agriculture, the two agreed to explore ways to support agriculture development cooperation to enhance food security in Kenya, which is a priority area of the Big Four agenda. Also, the MOU signed by Undersecretary Kaplan and Kenya's Treasury Cabinet Secretary provides a roadmap and framework for driving U.S. private sector participation and investment in all of the Big Four priority areas, and specifically the MOU lays out a new arbor overarching level of collaboration between the two countries to ensure transparent and timely procurement in accordance with ap applicable laws, support for commercial advocacy for U.S. businesses, technical assistance for U.S. businesses pursuing priority projects, and consideration by the U.S. government for prioritizing financing requests for these projects. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you, Kimberly, for that presentation. I recall that in selecting the countries for the fact-finding trip, Kenya was ranked highest by the PAC DBIA as a potential destination. And there was a good reason for that ranking. In my view, <coughs> the Kenyatta administration's commitment to our bilateral commercial relationship could not have been more clearly demonstrated during the trip. As Kimberly noted, President Kenyatta himself met with Undersecretary Kaplan and other members of the delegation twice in two days. The directive from President Kenyatta to his cabinet allowed us to finish and sign the MOUs before the delegation left the country. President Kenyatta presided over the signing of $100 million in commercial deals and engagements. And just last year, month, when President Kenyatta came to Washington to meet with President Trump, he took time to meet with myself, other members of the administration, and with a large group of U.S. business executives. The Kenyatta administration is seeking a greater American business presence in Kenya. The PAC-DBIA trip may well be a turning point in American business activities with Kenya. The MOU with Kenya provides us with a mechanism to work with the Kenya government on improving their business and contracting practices. It allows us to address barriers to American trade and investment. It will also provide opportunities for American companies to work the U.S. government on winning public procurement awards. Given the initial success with Kenya, we're pursuing similar MOUs with other countries. Commerce Department hopes to work with Kenya to promote business opportunities for American companies that will come from the opening of direct flights from Nairobi to New York at the end of October. Finally, in the fall of 2019, Commerce Department will host a major trade promotion event called Discover Global Markets. The focus will be on new business opportunities in Africa and the Middle East. Kenya will be highlighted as being a great market opportunity at that event. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Um, Barbara, do you have comments? Uh, thanks, Secretary. And uh, to all the leadership of the PAC DBIA, uh, I really appreciated it on this trip. Um, I found that uh, the leadership really helped us in many ways. I have two main comments. One is that I have been working on Africa for over 30 years. And uh, in the last 20 have been in some advisory role to our government on doing work in Africa. And I would like to say that in terms of the reception of, of uh, the groups, we used to sit in back rooms in the Commerce Department. 
And I find that the elevation of Africa to the level of the White House uh, is uh, very insightful and where it needs to be. And so I thank the current administration for this. Um, the second point is that when we go to Africa, we meet other uh, companies, countries uh, as teams. They come in as teams. They have their government, the private sector, and their civil society together, working together. In the past, the private sector has gone in alone, and so I really find from this trip there was a concerted effort for us to work together as a team, and I think that's very important, and I really felt that on this trip, and uh, it has opened other things for us as well and to uh, engaging with the government. So thank you. Thanks, Barbara. I think those are great points. <clears throat> um, we're now going to turn to Cote d'Ivoire. Even though we spent a day or two there and have recommendations and then the government changed the next day, I think they'll still be apropos. So uh, we'll turn to Andrew. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm happy to share our highlights and reflections on behalf of the Council on our fact-finding trip to Cote d'Ivoire. Under Secretary Kaplan led a delegation of representatives from nine U.S. government agencies and 27 business leaders from 16 U.S. companies. We were greeted warmly uh, by President Ouattara, his administration, uh, the U.S. Embassy, and local and Ivorian uh, business community. We had a full agenda during the two days in Abidjan, uh, and one of the things that certainly bears out of that is that there's a strong mutual desire to strengthen U.S. Côte d'Ivoire bilateral ties. During the visit, Under Secretary Kaplan and Chargé d'Affaires Brooker presided over a public signing ceremony for three deals. Uh, the first was the U.S. Trade and Development Agency signed a, part, a grant agreement with an Ivorian company. Uh, the U.S. African Development Foundation uh, and Bechtel formalized a partnership. And on behalf of Visa, I signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Finance for a government-wide partnership to bring millions of Ivorians into the formal financial system. The PAC DBIA also met with officials from the African Development Bank, and we learned more about their priorities, including the uh, high five priority areas. The U.S. Trade uh, and Development Agency and the AFDB signed an MOU that will strengthen collaboration on procurement, specifically in the areas of transparency, efficiency, and training. As a council, uh, we summarized our findings in three key takeaways. Uh, the first was around regional leadership. It's certainly not a coincidence uh, that um, Cote d'Ivoire was selected as the first francophone country uh, that the council visited. It's a natural entry point for U.S. companies trying to gain a foothold in an increasingly important region, and we believe more should be done to formalize the U.S. Cote d'Ivoire partnership. The second is around infrastructure. The Ivorian government uh, highlighted public-private partnerships as a preferred model for infrastructure development. The U.S. government, AFDB, and the U.S. private sector should partner with the Ivorian government to identify other viable frameworks to secure investment, financing, and implementation opportunities. And finally, the third is around global value chains. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire continues to be very focused on the production of raw agricultural goods, such as cashews and cocoa, and there's a real opportunity for U.S. companies to partner with Cote d'Ivoire to both expand industrial and technological production in agriculture and also pursue other means to diversify their economy, including through technology. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, Under Secretary Kaplan. Thank you, Andrew, for that great readout. I want to take a moment to echo Secretary Ross's statements regarding the effectiveness of the memoranda of understanding the Council recommended and to provide the Council with an update on Cote d'Ivoire following the trip. While we were working with our interagency colleagues represented here at today's meeting to determine and prioritize follow-up for all of the fact-finding trip countries. An immediate follow-up for Cote d'Ivoire has been the start of negotiations of an MOU between the government of the United States and the government of the Cote d'Ivoire. After the President, Prime Minister, and Vice President of Cote d'Ivoire heard of the MOUs we signed in Ethiopia and Kenya and intended to sign in Ghana, they approached us about signing an MOU with Cote d'Ivoire. This desire on the part of the government of Cote d'Ivoire for the MOU falls in line with its overarching message during the trip. 
Cote d'Ivoire is open for business. Like the other three MOUs we signed with Ethiopia, Kenya, and Ghana, the MOU we are finishing with Cote d'Ivoire will be constructed around a simple exchange. The host government intends to make available to the U.S. government information such as a list of priority pro projects in the sectors targeted in the MOU, and the U.S. government then intends to promote awareness of these projects with U.S. companies that might be interest, interested in participating. Adding to this, the U.S. government intends to form deal teams to provide information to qualified companies regarding availability of potential financing, grants, advocacy, and other forms of U.S. government resources to help make U.S. company bids for projects more attractive. In return, the U.S. government is asking the host government to focus on improvements in the business conditions or, quote, enabling environment so that U.S. companies are not dissuaded from par participating in these development projects by host government imposed barriers or policies. The MOU is expected to focus on agriculture, transportation, and energy. To finish the MOU, we are in the process of seeking advice from our industry trade advisory committees and interagency partners and are in ongoing discussions with the government of the Cote d'Ivoire. We also plan to reach out to the PAC, DBIA, and the, tra and the trade associations for input. We look forward to finishing it shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Um, Brad? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. My team and I want to uh, congratulate you on a successful trip across the continent, including uh, visits to MCC partner countries Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Your recommendations to strengthening the ties and commercial ties to the continent are thoughtful, well-written, and focused. And we are very pleased in the keen interest of the PAC members in our compact during the roundtable we held, and we hope that U.S. businesses do indeed leverage our investments with their own. As we previewed during the stop in Cote d'Ivoire, I am pleased to announce that we have signed a partnership agreement with Bechtel to develop a national infrastructure master plan with MCC eligible countries in Africa. Uh, and Andrew and I actually uh, signed that uh, MOU this morning just across the hall. Uh, this innovative public-private partnership will leverage MCC's deep sector infrastructure experience on the continent with Bechtel's global experience and expertise in integrated master plan development and implementation. We are looking forward to working with Bechtel to develop this product and assess how infrastructure master planning can catalyze a private sector investment in MCC partner countries. Thank you. Thanks, Brock. That's great news to hear. Andrew, um, you want to make a comment? Are you going to speak French now? <laughs> Unfortunately, my French is not that good. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on um, some of the comments that came out back to us and feedback from this trip to demonstrate how significant these trips can have. Uh, we got a, we reached the government of Cote d'Ivoire that we had been talking to over the last couple of years reached out to us and said, we really want to restart our conversations around a major infrastructure project that's worth over $2 billion there that, to connect their two economic ports. So I went back into country a couple weeks after that trip, and the reception had significantly changed from what we had previously had from them. Um, before it was, yes, we want American companies, oh yeah, let's talk again. This was a significant engagement to the point where the Prime Minister, who had just gotten back from China that morning, understood that I was in town and, and made room in his schedule and pulled together his key people to talk about this project. Um, to demonstrate, and they were very clear that they want to be able to show clear engagement with U.S. companies, um, especially following that trip. They also mentioned that the MOU was something that they were very focused on and excited to talk about uh, and hope to sign that soon. And then we would encourage that that be concluded, and we think that would be great uh, to support U.S. companies there. As Jay mentioned, it's not just the East that are, that are in Africa. There's strong competition from, of course, the French there, um, but the Turkish and, and other parts of Europe. Um, and these type of MOUs and these types of engagement make a significant difference. Uh, Bechtel continues to look to expand our presence in Africa uh, and, and looking to setting up a sub-regional office and potentially would set this up in Cote d'Ivoire. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, for Ghana, um, Bob Weta, please. Thank you, Jay. Um, IBM's Takrim El Tohami, who unfortunately at, at the last minute could not join us, prepared the following, following summary. The PAC DBIA delegation, led by Secretary Ross, met Ghana government leaders, participated in a U.S. Ghana business forum, and signed MOUs. Secretary Ross signed a G2G MOU outlining priority projects for U.S. companies wishing to do business in Ghana and providing a forum for addressing any trade barriers that would limit U.S. companies' abilities for taking advantage of these opportunities. U.S. TDA executed a grant agreement to conduct a feasibility study and bring American private sector expertise from the renewable energy sector to Ghana. IBM was pleased to execute an MOU with the Ministry of Lands to help the government explore and develop relevant blockchain capabilities and use cases for land registries. From our time in Ghana, we felt that U.S. investment was welcome and saw great opportunities for U.S. companies. However, some challenges remain. Looking at trade facilitation, as Ghana continues to implement U.S. aid and Customs and Border Protection recommendations to pr pr improve U.S. processes, U.S. companies still seek swifter action to modernize transactions. In energy and mining, Ghana is making significant processes, progress, which makes it of great interest to U.S. companies. Council members understand that mining industries are capital intense and require long-term commitments. However, we hope that when it comes to policy, Ghana looks to the U.S. as a model to enable global competition. Looking at procurement, we heard commitments to reform practices and bolster anti-corruption efforts. The government is appointing an independent special prosecutor. It is also looking to develop an, electric, an electronic procurement registry and a web pl platform for inquiries. These tools could ha be helpful for U.S. companies looking to enter and compete in Ghana. I'll close with technology more broadly. It was exciting to hear Ghana's vice president speak highly of his trip to Silicon Valley. He said that technology developed by U.S. companies, like blockchain, can help to drive economic transformations. This creates opportunities for IBM and U.S. companies broadly. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, Bob Perez from Customs and Border. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good morning, folks. It's my pleasure to be here and represent Secretary Nielsen and Customs and Border Protection. Uh, and speak to uh, our interest, our ongoing support, and gratitude uh, that the uh, folks who went on the trip uh, were able to meet with our team uh, in Ghana so that we could showcase a little bit of what we've been uh, doing by way of CBP's investment, uh, not just there, but really uh, throughout the region for some time. Um, I think most of you know and appreciate the national security mission of Customs and Border Protection is one of a complicated fine balance of both border security uh, but also economic security, uh, enabling and facilitating uh, trade uh, in, in a way that uh, could uh, further uh, strengthen uh, international trade, not just here, of course, but when we're engaging with our international partners, uh, help them find a path uh, to not only border management and better border management, uh, but uh, the uh, skill sets and the institutionalization of modern trade practices. Uh, both by way of uh, not only technological modernization, but processes, policies, laws, and the like. And so again, we were, we were just grateful to have the opportunity to showcase that to the group when they were there. Um, our ongoing commitment is unwavering. Uh, you know, as you alluded to in your opening comments, Jay, I think it's unquestionable. Certainly, I think this group understands, uh, but I want to share with you on behalf of CBP and DHS uh, that the strategic importance of ongoing investment, again, not just in Ghana, but throughout the sub-Saharan region is something we truly appreciate. Um, and we're going to continue to look for those opportunities uh, to make a difference alongside our in interagency partners who work with us hand in hand um, uh, to, again, help folks along uh, in, these, in these regions uh, to really build a 21st century international trade construct. So again, my pleasure to be with you all today and to, to continue to uh, invest our efforts in, uh, in all the good work that the PAC DBIA has done. So thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. We had a hard time figuring out who from our group would talk about customs, <laughs> but we finally uh, figured out that Laura would probably be the best. So um, 
I have to say, just picking up from what Mr. Perez said, um, it's really rare when a highly technical policy issue like customs modernization gets the priority attention that it really does deserve. And um, I really need to commend uh, the Secretary of Commerce and Under Secretary Kaplan for making this a priority issue because that's how U.S. companies are going to be able to export more and get into markets across uh, Africa. And uh, Ghana was a great example of how a country had recognized the central importance of customs modernization to not only strengthening its development opportunities, but also positioning itself as a gateway to more regional integration. And so in all the meetings that we had with the government of Ghana, they repeatedly touted how important uh, customs modernization was for its own market's emergence as a gateway to West Africa and ECOWAS, uh, the economic community of West African states. Um, and so we had the opportunity to meet with the Deputy Commissioner of of uh, Ghanaian Customs to really understand how they were moving to implement the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. And that's agreement that, that's a ready-made blueprint for customs modernization. But what was exciting is after that meeting, we had follow-on discussions with the Minister of Trade and I think every customs uh, official in Ghana saying, what more can we do to partner with the U.S. government because we want to be the best in West Africa on uh, uh, being an example to other countries of why customs Systems modernization is so important. And so in our April recommendation, we had said it was really important for companies to get that bird's eye view about what was happening with respect to customs modernization in the continent and then getting a better understanding of where greater partnership could occur. And we accomplished that on this trip. And I'm really excited about the fact that since this trip, because of the attention that this administration has given this issue, we've had uh, uh, a significant follow-on discussion, discussions, not just with the government of Ghana, but all the other countries that we visited saying, let's partner more together. And what's powerful is it's a public-private partnership. So we're working with CBP and other companies that are involved in logistics space to make sure these processes are powerful ones to drive U.S. exports and address some of the things that keep up uh, out of these markets, which is the corruption challenges at the borders. And so this was a powerful way to end the trip and um, recognize the central importance of customs modernization across the continent. And so I really have appreciated the partnership with CBP in particular because that makes all the difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Next time, could you have a little more enthusiasm when you speak? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my comments earlier on the uh, president of Ghana, well, I've, I neglected to mention that they had just received a $2.5 billion line from China XM, which obviously they are going to look to to enable a lot of uh, infrastructure projects. Um, that wraps up our country trip um, portion of the, uh, of the meeting. Is there any other um, comments that anyone wants to make before we move to the recommendations um, of, the, of the PAC DBI? Okay. All right. Laura, I turn it over to you. So uh, in terms of some of the specific recommendations, we wanted to start out with financing because in every single market that was clear as one of the fundamental issues that we needed to strengthen the, um, the tools that companies had um, to use across uh, the U.S. government spectrum. And so um, we were really uh, um, honored and I think it was so helpful to have um, Peter Sullivan from City with us because uh, the perspectives that City and uh, Mr. Sullivan were able to bring were so helpful in a lot of the discussions with the government. So I thought we'd start with you, Peter. That's great. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'd also like to express my appreciation to Secretary Ross and Under Secretary Kaplan for all your leadership and support of the PAC DBA and its work. Uh, Africa has become a highly competitive region, really due to its massive potential and growth. Now is the time to develop and execute a focused U.S. strategy that leverages our advantage and resources to not only be competitive in the region, but to really to be a leading force on the continent. PAC-DBI's fact-finding mission, you know, helped crystallize our collective thinking on this strategy. As Laura said, financing and risk mitigation was at the top of the agenda for many of the, the meetings. And our recommendations are based on the outcomes of those meetings, as well as the years of experience of many of the principals in, in PAC DBIA who operate and compete in Africa. We have proposed seven recommendations pertaining to finance. 
that cut across three main themes. Uh, the first theme is really a deployment of financial resources of the U.S. government in support of U.S. trade and investment flows. The provision of financing and risk mitigation is critical in effectively competing and leveling the playing field in, in Africa. Our recommendations with regards to a fully functioning XM Bank, uh, the passage of the Build Act, Build Act and the provision of USD liquidity addresses this need. Shortly, my colleagues from Instapro and Bechtel will expand on the essential nature and application of these resources. The second theme highlights the opportunities to leverage the resources of the U.S. government through the close collaboration with the private sector. Collaborative deal structuring, as evidenced by OPEC's work in the region, brings to the fore our nation's technical, financial, and operational strength. This partnership should also be extended um, to the work with MCC in leveraging its compact to realize associated trade and investment opportunities, and very happy to hear about the MOU with Bechtel. So it's a perfect example. Following on, the, the third and final theme is really about uh, creating a better enabling, transparent, and competitive environment for U.S. businesses in Africa. A collaborative approach needs to be extended to developing the technical and financial capabilities and capacities within Africa. The U.S. sector the U.S. private sector can work with U.S. Treasury, U.S. TDA, and the likes of African Development Bank to develop more liquid local markets, better regulatory regimes, and, and more transparent tra commercial transactions. We look, further, we look forward to further discussion and engagement on these proposed recommendations, but first let me call my colleagues from Instapro and Bechtel to comment on the recommendations, particularly pertaining to the deployment of financial resources. Thank you. So, Andrew, let's turn it over to you first. Thank you. Um, clearly, the financing is critical to any of these projects going forward and the impacts of what U.S. companies can do. A and being able to come up with innovative and creative financing solutions um, is going to be key to the success of U.S. companies operating in Africa, especially competing against um, our, the competition um, from the likes of China and Turkey that have also been very aggressive in their approaches to that. Having the right tools in our toolbox is also key, so the, the uh, re-highlighting the, the the benefits of having USX and fully engaged will help U.S. companies compete and be able to build uh, our footprint in Africa and deliver um, on our value proposition that is well recognized by these countries. Um, on recommendation number two around um, tapping into around some of the concessional and commercial financing, I've been able to bring the whole package of when we look at a project uh, for a road infrastructure, or an oil pipeline, or a port, to be able to tie in MCCs or, or US TDAs, uh, US aid programs for training into that will, will brings a more compelling offer to that. And I think looking at how to be able to put together those deal teams that's going to be able to tie in those agencies to bring a better value proposition is going to be uh, a, a key step that, that, can, that can help US companies. Um, we're, we're looking forward very much to working with MCC in Africa, and I think that will be a great step of creating a foundation for future work um, in these countries and potentially working with USAID, um, sorry, with MCC. Uh, and finally, on the, on the BUILD Act, we, we, we support that, and we think that's a great program or a, a great step to broaden OPIC's uh, ability to bring different types of financing, including equity, and to be involved in different parts of the project. Thank you. Kevin? Thank you, Laura and Secretary Ross. Uh, to put in context my comments, I feel like our company, Instapro International, represents smaller, privately held U.S. manufacturers, and I appreciate you having us on the, on the council. And also, what's unique is that we target the private sector. Small to medium enterprises quite often in the private sector of Africa is growing. And our pipeline in Africa is very significant. Opportunities are there. The greatest challenge for us is access to capital for our customers to put those purchases in place. By and large, by far, our biggest hurdle. And whether it's Ethiopia and looking for Forex and waiting in line potentially for years, to being in Kenya and being faced with 150% collateral requirements to purchase our equipment, deals stop. And so we are very much a proponent of, of promoting XM as a solution uh, for us. Um, we compete against the Chinese every day, Secretary, and we win on, on equipment quality, know-how, support, but when financing comes as part of the package, it's tough to compete with. And so we would encourage not only supporting XM and reauthorizing it, 
but in encouraging it to grow, encouraging creative financial solutions, encourage more aggressiveness in the approach. And with these signed MOUs, it's a great opportunity to jump in and, and work through creative risk mitigation processes that makes our side comfortable as well as bringing in these uh, foreign governments that we now have this momentum. So, so let's get after that. And secondly, I want to talk about OPIC as well. I'm pleased to see the BUILD Act is, is progressing. And we've had plenty of conversations with OPIC, but with our customer set, the requirement of requiring 25% U.S. ownership stops projects in its tracks with OPIC and creating the flexibility to fund different projects that don't require U.S. ownership of those customers that we have in Africa will create opportunities uh, for us and turning those opportunities into orders. Thank you very much.